Now Picrenier was doing one of his launches here and uh, uh, on his, one of his sides we have the range operations manager which uh, tonight is Andreas Dritten Price. And, and top, top right uh, of your screen throughout most of the countdown to HO liftoff you should have a small green box which is a repeater for the status panel and if at any time the box turns to red this will not mean we're about to show you some pornographic material but merely that we have some kind of a problem more about that later if and only if it's necessary and in a moment we shall be moving briefly into the launch control center to meet the third member of the coordinating team for tonight's launch. And here is Daniel Grund, the launch operations manager. We shall be visiting the control center in more detail for a bit longer later in the program. And we can tell you then what goes on in the CDL, as we call it. The unusual sight there of uh, a, the launcher in daylight. And now we're back in mission control to meet uh, Charles Bigot, Arena's first chairman and chief executive officer. He heads the flight command cell, which has a very precise function in the launch context, Suna. Yes, in case of a problem, uh, they are the senior decision-making uh, group, uh, which will be able to decide if the launch is going on or not. And now we have some film for you on the organization behind the Ariane launch activity. Formed in 1980 as the first industrial and commercial space transportation company in the world, Ariane Space operates the Ariane launch system developed by the French space agency CNES on behalf of the European space agency ESA. Ariane Space demonstrates European scientific and technical capabilities and has the backing of the space industry and banks of 13 countries. Ariane Space operates worldwide with its European headquarters at Evry, just outside Paris in France. A subsidiary in Washington DC in the USA. A branch office in the Asia Pacific zone located in Tokyo in Japan. and a launch complex in Kourou, French Guiana, with a unique geographical position close to the equator. Combined with the extremely accurate orbit injection of Ariane, this equatorial position extends the life of the satellites. Constantly adjusting to changes in international market demand, Ariane Space provides customers with a complete personalized range of launch services based on extensive experience and a highly reliable vehicle which can place payloads of up to 4.8 metric tons with Ariane 4 and in the near future 7 tons with Ariane 5 directly into orbit. Ariane Space is engaged in a long-term production program with its European space industry partners. The manufacturing, which follows a tight quality policy, is permanently aimed at meeting customer requirements worldwide. Twelve thousand highly qualified Europeans are engaged in this manufacturing activity. The success of this venture is largely due to the power and cohesion of the industrial partners involved. The principal contractors are Aerospatial, SEP, DASA, the Fiat Group, Matra Marconi Space, Casa, Berlicon Contrabass. The various launcher sub-assemblies are built in Europe and taken by sea, air and land to the Kourou spaceport. An opportunity perhaps sooner for a word of explanation for the very long interval since flight V-92. The scheduled passenger for the December launch Panamsat had some technical problem, I understand. Yes, as happened from time to time, <coughs> a design error was detected uh, 
in fairly late in the production, and uh, they had to redesign and rework that unit for the power subsystem. But I uh, note that Pan Am Sat uh, 6 is now back in the launch manifest for an April flight, I think. So the problem has been cleared? The problem has been cleared, and they are on schedule for a launch in April. And a look at the launcher campaign. Flight 93 launcher stages has arrived to Cayenne from the European Industrial Partners Manufacturing Centers by air and sea transportation. Then they were brought to Guyana Space Center. The launcher campaign has started on 3rd December 1996 in the assembly dock with the erection of the first stage. Then first stage was transferred to the launch table followed by second stage integration on top of the first stage. Liquid strap-on boosters integration was completed on 9th December 96. Third stage was placed on top of the second stage. After completion of the first phase activities, launcher campaign was put on hold for 15 days until 13 January 97, when rollout of the launcher to the launch zone has been carried out. Cryogenic fueling arms were connected to the launcher, which will be used during fueling operations of the third stage few hours before the launch. The two spacecraft, prepared and fueled at different locations, were encapsulated and the payload composite was integrated on the launcher at four working days before the launch. Flight 93 will utilize 56.3 meter tall an Ariane 4 rocket with four liquid strap-on boosters weighing 481 tons with a thrust of 5.7 kilonewton at the liftoff. Time check, less than 23 minutes to go, status green. And now we can turn to our passengers on flight V93. And in the picture you all have the mission manager for this flight. And here we see uh, Walter Brown, Senior Vice President, GE Americam. The Ariane payload uh, manager here is uh, Mesut Chichiko, who we just saw. When we talked to uh, Walter Brown uh, yesterday, he had high words of praise for the close co cooperation between the two satellite uh, teams and Ariane Space. Above the globe, GE Americom brings the world closer together. From 22,300 miles in space, our fleet of communication satellites relays information and entertainment across the United States. In September 1996, we launched our newest satellite, GE-1. It's the first of a new generation. And GE-2 will carry Primestar, the first direct-to-home satellite TV service. GE-3 and 4 are already being planned. These CKU band hybrids provide advanced design, 15-year service, plus more power and redundancy. You can rely on GE satellites to provide the edge you need to succeed in cable and broadcast TV, radio, government, and industry. And soon our Sirius 2 service will bring the same level of quality and reliability to communications delivery across the European continent. GE Americom's advanced ground facilities provide full support for our satellite services. Each of our network operations in four key locations across the U.S. is equipped with state-of-the-art telemetry, tracking, and control capabilities. Across the country or around the world, when it comes to value, service, and productivity in critical communication services, you can count on GE Americom. At GE Americom, our business is helping yours. GE2 is the third satellite to be launched for this customer on Ariane with the SATCOM C1 
And uh, here we see um, Dan Harrell, also of GE America. He's obviously sending some coded message to us. Uh, SATCOM C1 was sent up on a flight to V40 and C3 on V52 with uh, a fourth satellite, uh, SATCOM K3, also placed into orbit on Ariane, but it was in fact sold on the ground to SES and renamed Astra 1B. And GE2 is uh, very much like the GE1, which was launched in September 1996. I think it's only the solar panels that are different. And coming up now, we have some film shot during the GE2 preparation campaign. The GE2 spacecraft, which was manufactured by Lockheed Martin, arrived at Rochambeau Airport in French Guiana on the 27th of December. It was then transported directly to the Guiana Space Center. After 11 days of checkout and deployments, the spacecraft was ready for the fueling operations. The G-2 spacecraft was then transferred to the S-3B building, where the hazardous operations were carried out. These included fueling, pressurizing, and balancing the spacecraft. The spacecraft was encapsulated under the fairing on the 17th of January and mated with the co-passenger on the 21st of January. At this point, the payload composite was ready to be transferred and mated with the launch vehicle. The launcher is still out there. That's always a reassuring sight. And uh, this time, alongside uh, Mr. Chichika, we meet Eckhart Schubert, CEO of uh, Nawalsat. Nawalsat is an Argentinian company formed by a European consortium in which GE Americom has a 27% B share interest. But uh, more about that kind of interlocking situation later. Coming up in just a moment, we have some film concerning the Nawal satellite. The name, incidentally, means Puma in Amerindian. The development of the telecommunications market is also an important part of the rapid economic growth in South America. However, terrestrial cable or radio-based systems were too expensive in South America because of the special geographical situation. In early 97, Nahuel 1, a satellite-based communication system specially developed for the Latin American market, will be put into service. The satellite covers three zones. These range from the southern tip of South America to the south of the USA. This Nahuel 1 telecommunication satellite is the first satellite really designed for the needs of customers in Latin America. It's a satellite for all types of uh, telecommunications, voice, data, telephony, video, television, up to the ultimate technology of direct-to-home television. DASA, Daimler-Benz Aerospace Germany, was one of the first European aerospace companies to react to the challenges of the South American market. And in 1992, as the driving force of an international consortium, applied for a satellite operating license for which the Argentinian government had invited tenders. When the license was granted, DASA, together with its European partners Aerospatial and Alenia, established Nahuelsat, the operating company with its headquarters in Buenos Aires. Nahuelsat charged DSS, Dornier Satellitensysteme, a corporate unit of DASA, as prime contractor and system integrator to deliver the Nahuel satellite system into orbit. Besides the technical components, the contract package includes the organization of the launch as well as insurance and financial services. The Nahuel ground control station is supplied by Alenia Spazio Italy. The Nahuel satellite itself was built by Aerospatiale France. However, Dornier Satellitensysteme contributed major subsystems. As the strategic main investor, our company is responsible 
for developing the technical and financial concept and also set up the management requirements for its implementation. Consequently, NAWAL represents an important building block in DASA's space commercialization strategy. NAWAL-1 has 18 transponders with a bandwidth of 54 megahertz each. 36 television programs or 18,000 telephone links can be transmitted at the same time. In order to be able to meet the growing communications requirements in Latin America in the future, NAWALSAT is already planning NAWAL-2 to double the transmission capacity by the beginning of 1998. NAWAL is smaller and lighter than GE2. Its 18 transponders are exclusively KU band. However, agreements with the Brazilian BrazilSat and Mexican Solidaridad operators. And I'll cut, uh, I'll break in on myself here with uh, to name Mosen Khalil of International Finance Corporation, Werner Heinzmann, the head of DASA, and Dieter Uban of the German uh, Ministry of Economics, among the many distinguished visitors who we have here in Jupiter this evening. And uh, to complete our passenger review, we now have some film on the NAWAL satellite campaign. Cayenne Airport at 1 a.m. on December 5, 1996. The NAWAL satellite is unloaded from a cargo plane. The satellite has arrived from Aerospatial Cannes, where it was manufactured and integrated in cooperation with Daimler-Benz Aerospace and Alenia Spazio. The Argentine company Nahuelsat SA will utilize from March 1997 onwards the 18 Cuban transponders in order to provide television and telecommunication services for Latin America. Nahuelsat SA has contracted to Daimler-Benz Aerospace of Germany the turnkey delivery in orbit of the complete system, consisting of the satellite coming from Aerospatial France, the control ground station coming from Alenia Spazio Italy, and the Ariane 4 launch vehicle. The final verifications and activities of the satellite have been performed in Kourou. One of the major activities was the filling of the satellite tanks with propellant. This propellant will provide a satellite lifetime of 12 years after separation from the launch vehicle. The satellite is now finally integrated with its co-passenger and is ready for launch with Ariane 4. Status still green. The Met report we had just before we came on the air was nominal and we will have a final weather data in a couple of minutes' time. In the meantime, we're going to uh, take you on a visit to the Launch Control Center, the CDL, just one kilometer from the pad. As we move inside the CDL, what are the main operations controlled from this uh, point to now? Uh, here are all the preparations for the launcher during the last six weeks, or oh, sorry, four weeks, and uh, specifically today is the preparation for the final countdown with uh, uh, removal of the gantry and uh, fueling of the third stage. In contrast, of course, to the other stages and the boosters which were fueled yesterday, and indeed the satellites. Yes, the satellites were fueled uh, a few days ago. And uh, in a moment or two, we should be able to introduce you to two more leading players in the activities here in uh, the Guiana Space Center. Yeah, here is Michel Mignot, who is the head of the Guiana Space Center. And we hope to see the resident representative of the European Space Agency. Not yet, perhaps later on. And finally, a film introduction to an important manufacturer partner of the Ariane program, Air Liquide. 
Erle Kied is world leader in the production of industrial gases for a wide range of applications. These include electronics, the chemical and steel industries, healthcare, welding and cryogenics, and the aerospace sector in particular. 75% of activities are located outside France. We have a worldwide payroll of 25,000 covering all five continents, and we've been operating in North America and Japan since the start of the century. Here in South America, we have a staff of 1,500, mainly in Argentina. As a specialist in the cryogenics field, Air Liquide has played an important part in the Ariane development programs right from the beginning. We manufacture the third stage propellant tank for Ariane 4 near Grenoble in France. Air Liquide developed and installed the cryogenics facilities for the Ariane 4 launcher pad in Kourou and is responsible for operational maintenance. And we're now manufacturing launcher cryogenic propellants here in French Guiana. The Air Liquide local subsidiary ALSG operates production units for oxygen, hydrogen and nitrogen. We begin our tour with the atmospheric gas separation plant, which produces oxygen and nitrogen for the Kourou launch base. We're now in the hydrogen plant. Air Liquide uses a methanol reforming process to produce hydrogen for the Ariane 4 third stage and the Ariane 5 heavy launcher. We conclude our short visit with the air and helium compression units. Helium is used principally for pressurization and control systems and also for cooling the payloads. Air and helium are piped to the various user sites. Well, I was hoping that you'd been listening to the latest Met uh, report while we were see watching that film sooner, but apparently we had a slight problem. But we can only assume that everything is okay in that sector because everything is green on the status panel. That's correct. We did, in fact, have some doubts uh, uh, over the last few, few days because we're slap in the middle of the heaviest part of the rainy season. But the weather constraints are, in fact, particularly tight, are they not? Uh, so we now come to our last piece of film. This was shot only five hours back. This shows the rollback of the huge gantry used to access and protect the launcher during final preparation and integration of the payload. So for the last few hours, the launcher has only been secured to the, the, to, to the cryogenic fueling arms and the clamps which anchor it to the table. And there's been no one in the launch zone around the pad since rollback, with all operations fueling, check out and so on, controlled from the CDL. And we're coming up now to a major change in the situation. Top H0-6 minutes. We enter the final segment of this long negative count as we commence the six-minute synchronized sequence. Control has now passed from the team of human operators to the two ground computers. And so the full story, please, uh, Suna.
Now, uh, if we have a red inside the synchronized sequence, the control stops, the count stops, and the clock goes back to uh, T0, minus six minutes, and the launcher is returned to the safety state. Safety state? That means that we're going back to the situation as it was before we started the countdown, including uh, reworking the arming of the launcher. And also getting on to external power, for instance. And uh, as the case may be, also the satellite might go back to uh, external power. Well, anyway, we hope that uh, we shan't have that uh, transition this evening. A little under four and a half minutes to T0. Time is accelerating here in, uh, certainly in the com commentary box. And the main events in these last few minutes, Suno, uh, there principally? Will be, uh, there will be preservation to flight pressure of the tanks. Uh, we will arm the launcher. Uh, we'll also go on to onboard power and uh, finally release the uh, inertia platforms and so on. And you can see that the uh, tension is mounting a bit uh, at the customers. They are checking up that the satellite is all right. The, uh, we're really well into the nail-biting sequence now. And here we have... Um, Coming up on your screen, here it is, a close look at the cryogenic arms, which have been uh, piping liquid oxygen and hydrogen into the third stage tanks for the last three hours. The curious picture that you see is provided by two cameras with the, the central part of the launcher squeezed out, and there she goes. The arms will open five seconds before T0, creating the primary condition to authorize the ignition procedure. We'll see the arms again at that moment. And uh, we are now at uh, flight pressure of the uh, LOX tank, and we'll soon be there on the hydrogen tank as well. The count's been running now for 14 and a half hours. Does uh, each operation in this, this long count have to be com uh, <coughs> completed in a specific time bracket or by a specific uh, time or merely in sequence? If you're talking about the 14 hours, Simon, there is, of course, a lot of flexibility to do things differently. Uh, we can uh, have margins and possibility to do things in a different sequence if necessary. However, during these last six minutes, if everything, anything is out of sequence, we will see a red. Yes, and, and uh, all the way along through the count. Uh, there is a potential knock-on effect if one operation is delayed, I assume. That is correct. Well, as we are less than two minutes to go, just to relieve the mounting tension a wee bit, here's a question. You're at the wheel of a beautiful Ferrari, and just behind you is an enormous lion, and over your head there's a helicopter flying round and round. What do you do? Answers, please, by phone or fax. We're a little more than a minute to go now, and all support systems and ground stations are on full alert. Are they not sooner? Everything has to be cleared down. People are waiting for the last minutes and uh, uh, ready at all the downrange stations, the radar here, the telemetry. And we're coming up to the Stop. final minute. The launcher is on onboard power. And the satellite has been on onboard power for um, several minutes now. And it's ready. Servo motors armed. The tasks of the launch site teams are almost over. In a few seconds, it'll be the turn of the tracking and telemetry system. And the launcher is armed. 
And we come to the final voice count. Tous Stereo, attention pour les décomptes finales. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Top. Allumage des huit moteurs. Décollage. Pression foyer normal. Les paramètres à bord sont normaux. And with 30 seconds intermission, with a steady climb, we are tracking straight away on the infrared cameras on Ile Royale. Tous les paramètres à bord sont normaux. Normally, at this point, we would still be under standard camera from the CDL, but weather conditions do not allow that. And Simon, you could see from the very slow liftoff that this is the heaviest Ariel 4 that's lifted off from Kourou. 481 tons. But we have a steady climb. Six kilometers up, just over a minute into mission. Steady burn from the four stage one motors and the four boosters. Something which you may have uh, noticed just as the launcher was clearing. La trajectoire Time. est normale, tous les paramètres à bord sont normaux. And we're starting to get the steady stream of announcements from the DDO. He's just uh, told us that uh, all onboard parameters are nominal. The uh, debris that you saw falling off the launcher at that point was not in fact the result of uh, deterioration because the launch had gone by, past its uh, best used by, best uh, by date. It was the thermal cladding of the second stage. Now what does that, uh, what purpose does that serve? Uh, it is there sort of? to keep the second stage in uh, ambient condition which is, gives the best performance for the normal. Uh, Simon, why don't we have it on the First stage. Maybe. Indeed. You and, tell me. And that is because uh, the, there is a more thermal mass on the first and uh, first stage and the boosters, and as well they are more tolerant to, des quatre to temperature. We just have uh, confirmation of uh, jettisoning of the four solid propellant boosters. Sorry, liquid propellant boosters. And uh, we now have on our Tous screen, on your screen, the trajectory chart, which will be with us right through to separation of the payloads. A word of, uh, a detailed word of explanation, please, Suna. So the trace, you see the ring on the trace, that is the predicted one, and the cross is the actual data. Uh, and that is the altitude trace, and on the bottom you have the trace over ground. And you can see maybe that the, sat, uh, that the launcher started due east from Kourou. We're doing a dog leg to not to come too close to Kourou. Uh, and uh, on the right hand side you have the T is the time, of course, simple. And then you have the radar tracking, which Extinction is the first, uh, first stage burnout. And uh, the S is the uh, separation, uh, du premier étage, separation image du deuxième étage. of the two stages the and ignition of the second stage. The, staying with the tracking, tracking station for the moment, we are tracking locally from uh, the Guiana stations for the moment, but later on we shall, be, we shall have the launcher picked up by downrange stations in Natal, Ascension Island and uh, Libreville and we shall keep you informed as this happens. And coming back to the data on your right, the S is on the angle under which the radar is looking at the uh, launcher. The altitude, A altitude, 110 kilometers. And we've already de, de la coiffe. We just have, uh, we've just dropped the fairing as we get into a very thin atmosphere. And that's why we get rid of the fairing, not to carry on useful material higher up in the orbit. 
the uh, objective being, of course, to drop any superfluous mass the first second we can do it. And talking of uh, mass loss, we have already been uh, lost a great deal of fuel mass because we have been burning, I think, at, uh, at uh, what was the figure you, you told me? Two tons a, a second? For the first stage of the boosters, yes, two That's, tons a uh, second. That's an incredible burn rate. And uh, we can also, s at that burn rate for the first and the second stage, we were just below four kilometers per second when we uh, released the fairing. And you can see the speed is going up here with 4.8 kilometers per second, which is down in your right-hand corner. Uh, an interesting point, uh, a process that was going on until we uh, dropped the fairing, because uh, we had ground air pressure inside the, uh, the payload compartment. We had to vent this to the external atmosphere to equalize, equalize pressure, that is. And we're coming. Extinction du deuxième étage. And here we get there. We. At the end. Extinction. Our burnout of the second. À l'image du troisième étage. And there we have the best news so far. We have ignition of the third stage engine, and the start of the very long third stage burn time. And the performance parameters are good. In fact, uh, talking of the performance parameters, I think we might give a word of explanation as to how. The DDO is in a position to provide this regular flow of, of uh, launcher status data. Uh, we have telemetry coming down from the launch vehicle at uh, all stages of the flight. And there is about 500 or more than 500 measurement points on Ariane 44L. And, uh, uh, parameters are normal. and the selected uh, about 50 measurement values uh, are coming directly up on the screen. Uh, close to the tracking station uh, where uh, we get the information directly on what's happening on the launch vehicle. This is of course all, of course all the primary data to ensure that the flight is correct. And of course another continuous process that was uh, running from liftoff through to ignition of the uh, third stage engine was the chill down process, the third stage burning cryogenic very low temperature liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Uh, a word perhaps about that, uh, the process, how, how is this achieved uh, sooner? At the uh, liftoff, the, uh, the third stage engine is basically at ambient conditions. And uh, to be able to start it up, we need to get it down to the cryogenic uh, temperatures. And therefore, to the two many seconds of the liftoff, uh, we open the valves of the third stage uh, fuel lines and that will cool down the whole of the engine and the, in particular the turbo pump to get it functioning well at the start up as we saw it. Well after the flurry of events since the clamps opened and Ariane lifted off we uh, have a bit of a breathing space during this uh, stage three burn time. This is the first Ariane Space launch in 1997 so we can appropriately look both forward and back. First then, um, a review of the busy 12 months we had in 1996, Suno. Yes, it was a very hard year, a lot of launches, uh, and uh, in addition, a new record of 15 satellites put into orbit uh, last year. Also interesting is that uh, we had to use the flexibility of Varian Space and its teams, including the customers, where uh, we launched uh, without uh, really long-term planning two, two satellites during the year with very short notice. One was Flight uh, 87, where uh, the decision to launch uh, that particular payload, an Intelsat satellite, was taken only at the end of February. There was a slot open. And the same uh, happened uh, in, uh, later in the year where the uh, EcoStar satellite, the contract uh, uh, was signed and agreed in April and we launched in September. So uh, we can summarize all that by saying that uh, satellite customers are frequently in an awful hurry, but they're also sometimes late. Yes, anything can happen and some of the uh, last year's uh, passengers uh, planned passengers were late, moved into this year, 
and we had some others which were ready to fly and had no opportunity. So we used our flexibility. And what, in fact, was the impact of the, the gap between uh, November of last year and now? On the overall goal of Ariane Space to launch 30 launch, uh, launchers in uh, uh, three years, it has no impact at all. Uh, with this launch, we have uh, kept the rate of approximately one launch a month. Uh, since 22 months, this is also the 22nd launch. That is, uh, again, impressive data. And what about production? Uh, as we started uh, launching uh, already in 1995, 11 launches and uh, 10 launches last year, uh, we also need to produce in the same rate, which means that from last year onwards, uh, it is now possible to produce 12 launch vehicles a year which is around 90 engines, for instance. So it's uh, almost uh, an engine a week, oh, two engines a week yes, uh, indeed. being produced. Before we move on to uh, the current year, I think uh, perhaps one particularly significant figure is the total tonnage of uh, payloads placed into orbit in 1996, no less than 37.8 tonnes. So, looking now forward, the uh, launch manifest for 1997 indicates an objective of, again, 12 Ariane launches, another tight, ambitious schedule. It's as crowded as it was last year, so, and we can expect as well as we now is working in parallel, uh, satellites are produced as fast as they can, and launchers as well, which means that uh, anything that happens may change the planning and uh, I believe we have to use the flexibility of Ariane Space to uh, make an optimum launch schedule this year as well. Well, there's a very considerable difference between the, uh, the three-year lead time of, of a few years back and the two years or less uh, as, as the current figure. Is this not true? That is correct. Uh, the satellite manufacturers pressed their lead time to uh, around two years and uh, trying to do it even shorter, which means that it's very difficult to plan more than three years ahead. We have the uh, launcher picked up on the tracking station on Ascension Island. And of course, what we uh, uh, didn't tell you at the time, tracking from Kourou has now terminated. We've also terminated the tracking from the Natal station with radar, and you can see on the uh, uh, screen that uh, the means we're tracking with the moyenne it's now the inertia uh, measurement system on board so it's telemetry giving the position of the launch vehicle right uh, there's one particular point of interest uh, among many others in in tonight's launch um, the two satellite builders concerned Lockheed and Aerospatial represented between them the lion's share of the payloads carried by Ariane last year, and they're going to do it just the same way this year. That is absolutely correct. It's, uh, they, they are covering more than 50% uh, of the uh, covered last year, and even a bit more fin this year. Du lanceur par les moyennes de Natal. Another um, interesting point surrounding this launch is the uh, you could call it specialization of uh, Ariane Espace with the uh, Latin American market, because uh, dating back to 1985, Ariane has carried four Brazilsat uh, payloads, two Solidaridad, and uh, two Hispasat for Spain, which uh, also serves the Latin American market. And now, of course, no Noel. That is correct. Uh, also, uh, Noel is one of the new operators, and uh, in the 19 orders that uh, were obtained last year, five of them were also new operators. So we're in a, in a changing market uh, with new operators on one hand, and uh, you said that uh, also South America is one new market with more satellites. Uh, uh, Asia Pacific, very much so, uh, a fellow traveler in that, uh, in that direction. In fact, uh, just about anywhere you look in the space business uh, these days, 
launches, satellites, and the rest, you see change, 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 commercial, technological, financial, political, you name it. Absolutely correct. Uh, in particular, you can look at uh, uh, GE uh, as an organization, which uh, is not only, uh, as you said before, uh, the owner of uh, uh, GE2, with, uh, uh, and the GE2 payload is going to, used, to be used the K-band side of it, the 24 transponders, for the Prime Star direct-to-home television in the States, which is another uh, is a player on the market which is increasing its capacity. Uh, GE is also a part owner of uh, Naulsat, which means that South American market for direct TV is coming. Uh, I don't want to alarm you sooner, but we seem to be losing altitude at the moment. We use the very definite dip in the trajectory path. And that's totally correct and totally normal. It's pre-programmed. The optimization of the third stage, which has a long burn and with a heavy mass in the beginning and a lighter mass at the end, uh, is uh, taking help of the gravitational forces of the Earth in reality to increase its speeds. So the altitude is getting a bit lower uh, while the speed is building up and then we're getting back to the nominal perigee altitude altitude, which is uh, 200 kilometers. And everything is normal on board. Uh, everything is working Indeed. perfectly. And the reason for that is that the flight program is uh, being read and executed correctly by the launcher. A word or two about the flight program. When is this uh, loaded in the OPC, the onboard computer sooner? It is just loaded one hour approximately before launch. Uh, so it should be ready 50 minutes before the liftoff. And it contains? It contains all the parameters from the launch vehicle, its performance parameters, the demand for the tra tra trajectory, where we put the satellites, and it also includes the masses of the satellites, their inertias for the separation part or the what we call the orbit dynamics part where orbit mechanics where we put the satellites in the right direction and separate them from the launch vehicle. And looking at the display, uh, we can uh, see quite clearly that the altitude is building up again. And in fact, uh, let's take a look at the uh, speed, 9.1 kilometers per second, that's very fast indeed. And it's coming pretty close to the satellization requirement, which is 9.7 kilometer per second. And uh, just to keep the thing moving forward, we have uh, acquisition of the launcher, what remains of it, by the Libreville tracking station. And we come very close to burnout of the third stage. By my stopwatch, we have uh, less than a minute to go. The Libreville station will track the uh, satellite and, sorry, the launcher uh, also after separation until the end of the mission. All the parameters are normal. Everything is still normal. Ascension and tracking has Extinction du troisième étage. been completed, and we have not burnout but shutdown of the third stage engine. There is a distinction here, the uh, difference being that there is fuel left in the tank of the third stage engine by compared with uh, the first and second stages, which literally burnt out their fuel. Now, what is the significance of this difference, Suna? One thing is that the, the remaining fuel is used for the orientation of the satellite and uh, orientation the, du composite. And the, the uh, uh, third stage to, for avoidance maneuver and to put then the, the uh, various 
part in their right position. And the avoidance manoeuvre, which we'll talk about in a little more detail later on, is in fact the nudge to um, put the, uh, the um, empty and now useless uh, third stage into an orbit which will not cause any interference. That is correct. Oh, remember, we should, I think this is a bit late, but in any case, say hello to our other viewers all over Europe, which is looking at space night. Yes, indeed. So we have, uh, we are in the process of spin up at this moment as we uh, approach separation of GE2, is that correct? That is correct, and uh, the GE2 is in its right position as well, pointing and right. Walter Brown looking a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say anxious, but uh, anticipatory. Separation de GE2. And there and is... It's okay. We have separation of the first passenger, GE2. Applause, muted out of courtesy for the second customer, the second payload, for which, uh, for separation of which we've got to wait to around four minutes from now. What happened is that we'll spin down the uh, composite, what's left of it, turn the it in another direction, composite. and uh, separate the top of the uh, mini speller. Right. Perhaps uh, we could describe the actual procedure for separation of the satellites. This is entirely different, of course, from the interstage separation process. That's correct. I think we should take both. Maybe the satellites are held to the launcher by a band with clamps on them. The famous clamp band, yes. Clamp band, and uh, uh, tension is put through a bolt, which is tightened up. And around the bolt, there is a called a bolt cutter, which is an explosive device. Pyrotechnic. Pyrotechnic device with, with a knife. And uh, that knife cuts the bolt when the command is given from the onboard computer to separate. The Spelda, for instance, on the other hand, has an explosive cord around its circumference at the bottom of the Spelda, which opens up a a riveted connection, and it separates. Separation de la spelda. There we have that. Indeed, the spelda, the top of the spelda. We won't say the spelda has blown its top, but it's... Reorientation du composite. The way is now free for the second passenger to pop out when released in just the same way with the clamp band system. Uh, a little bit of data on the immediate future for GE2. The uh, first acquisition should be obtained 47 minutes after liftoff in Mauritius. The um, first firing of the Apogee motor should occur after 16 hours, will occur after 16 hours. The solar panels will open after four days and the satellite will reach its orbit station after five days. Simon, what's really separating? I said the you know you're cutting off the the uh, metal and so on, and you're also separating the band. But really, what makes the satellite separate from the rest of it? Are there springs? There are springs. Yes, indeed. And there are uh, could be uh, all between three and uh, six springs, depending on the mass of the various parts and uh, the speed with which. They separate is about one to two meter per second, so it's not very fast. No, I, I, was, I was going to say they're not particularly strong. They don't push it away uh, with a violent shove. It's a it's a gentle movement, is it not? It's a uh, quite a gentle movement. The the uh, most difficult part of it, or the hardest part for the satellite, is the uh, actually cutting of the bolt, which gives a certain shock, but the satellite is built and tested for that. And I believe that in the uh, clamp band system, there are some things called catchers, which uh, literally catch the, um, the clamp band as it, uh, as it opens. And that is to keep it there so it can bounce back mm. to avoid the rebound. Exactly. And 
there, we can really set off steam. We have separation of Nawal 1A. The two payloads have now set out on their autonomous life in space. But the acquisition du troisième étage par la station d'Artsibichuk. Launch mission is not entirely completed yet for Arinspas. We have the avoidance maneuver. To put it in another position, another altitude, other direction. And we have passivation. Passivation. The, the residual fuels, which are in two compartments, there are different amounts of them, and to ensure that the internal pressure or the pressure difference is not too high, which might damage and crack the tanks which are there. Uh, we're venting the tanks to ensure that it's in a good condition after the launch. And we have coming up now a replay of the launch sequence which you saw live just over 25 minutes ago. paramètres à bord sont normaux. Ah, J'ai vu moteur. Décollage. And here from a different Pression angle. foyer normal. It looks just as good second time and third time around. What uh, are you, Zuna? Yes, and uh, again, I'm uh, really feeling the very heavy. It goes very slow in the beginning. If you compare that to with our a GT, GT, with a 44P, for, for example, which is a GTI model, which goes uh, just like that uh, spanking new Medica you showed me uh, yes. earlier this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Talking of spanking new motor cars uh, makes me think of Ferraris. I don't know whether there have been any phone calls or faxes. So we have no blinking red lights here telling us that we have somebody on the hotline. And congratulations all around. It's happy people. Well, at this moment, we can now announce the 22nd consecutive successful launch by Ariane 4. You talked about the uh, acquisition of uh, G2, which was 47 minutes, and now L is the same approximately? Or uh, Yes, in fact, it's a little wee bit quicker. Now L should be uh, picked up by Perth after 45 minutes, followed by Ankara Benavides, which, is the, uh, which will be the uh, operational ground station for the satellite and uh, finally Chilworth in the UK. Uh, first Apogee motor firing 37 hours and like GE2 solar panels after four days. And uh, generally satellites uh, do uh, minimum of two, generally three or maybe four Apogee boost motor firings with the liquid engines. As both of these satellites have bipropellant subsystems. Right. Well, of course, it looks to be uh, all over for this evening, and it certainly is for many uh, many of the teams involved in this uh, launch uh, campaign. But here on the uh, on the uh, launch range, uh, as I speak, work on the pad has not yet commenced, but it will uh, it will do so within the uh, the next 30 minutes with the uh, firemen going in to carry out the initial check through and uh, refurbishment of the pad for the next launch scheduled in uh, three, four weeks time sooner. Uh, uh, about three, three, and a week, three and a half weeks time, yes. That will um,
full refurbishment work will com commence uh, tomorrow. Uh, that will take uh, about six working days before the launch table is rolled back and uh, we have the next launch vehicle coming out. But I want to also say a word to the team here has finished. We finished our work on the Ariel Space side. But now to all of you who have been looking at that in the uh, ground stations who are now taking care of your babies to get them safely into geostationary orbit over the next week, testing and so on, their job has just started for real. And in fact, uh, talking of, uh, of uh, in-orbit testing, um, we failed to mention the fact uh, earlier on that um, in particular, GE2 is uh, remarkable for its speed of, of uh, transition from launch to yield, in other words, getting on stream commercially and uh, generating revenue. And that's following the tendency of getting you know, shorter lead times for satellites and... Simplifying the satellites too. Yeah, and, and shorter uh, uh, launch campaigns with down to 23 uh, days for a launcher, about the same for a satellite, and finally getting them operational as soon as possible. Well, a, a great many things have changed since we first did a, a launch commentary together, which, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, was back in 1990. And the, uh, the campaign time was nothing like as, as uh, short as 23 days then. Yes, if you look at the, the satellites here, they're still on uh, GE doing some of the integration work here but it's very little uh, the testing has been down to the necessary minimum and uh, it is a very speedy activity um, well, once upon a time i think there are 14 weeks satellites were here in crew and we're coming up to speech time We shall, we shall hear, and yes, we shall hear. Shall we go first? Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, our company, Ion Space, I am uh, obviously very pleased to confirm the successful launch of uh, Naval 1A and uh, GE2 satellites with the V93 flight of an Ariane 44 l this evening. I have not yet the exact value of the parameters of the orbit, but uh, it seems to me obvious that the two satellites are on a very precise and very good uh, orbit. My first reaction, of course, is uh, a great uh, uh, pleasure for uh, our both customers. We are very pleased to have launched the first Ar Argentinian satellite for the whole uh, Latin American uh, region. And uh, I wish to congratulate also uh, the Naval Sat Consortium, and especially our partner, Daimler-Benz Aerospace, for this uh, success. We also are very happy to have launched GE2 for uh, the famous uh, uh, GE Americom uh, operator, which is, uh, as you know, since a very long time, since the very beginning of the era of uh, uh, space telecommunication in the US, one of the most important pioneers of uh, space telecommunication. With the launch of these two satellites, it's obvious that uh, Arian Space is uh, participating to the progress of uh, space telecommunication for the whole American uh, continent since uh, uh, north, the upper north, until the down south. And it is a very great satisfaction for us. For our uh, company also, it is the first launch of uh, 1997, but it is also the first of a very long series of uh, 12 launches that we expect 
to achieve during uh, this year. The next uh, launch is now scheduled uh, on the 25th of February for launching the Intelsat 801 satellite, the first of the new series of Intelsat 8 for this uh, prestigious uh, orga organization. So thank you very much. And uh, I give the floor to Walter Brown of uh, G America. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonsoir. Dans le monde entier, il y a beaucoup des organisations de lancement. Et je, je crois que chaque année, il y a de nouvelles organisations de lancement. Mais je sais que dans tout le monde, dans le monde entier, il n'y a pas une organisation qui est meilleure qu'Ariane Espace, qui est meilleure que son... qui est meilleur que Centre Spatial Guyanais. Et ce soir, je pense que vous êtes sans égal, que vous êtes non pareil. Et je parle de mon cœur. Alors, pour la troisième fois dans les derniers sept ans, je dis à M. Bégaud et à tous les gens d'Ariane Espace et de Centre Spatial Guyanais, merci beaucoup pour un lancement parfait. Merci, Monsieur Walter Brown. Your French is uh, excellent. Excellent. <laughs> And now I will give the floor to Werner Heinzmann, president of uh, Daimler-Benz Aerospace. Yeah, merci, Charles. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am really very, very happy. My first reaction after this uh, wonderful and perfect uh, launch uh, this evening. Uh, I would like to congratulate uh, the very professional team of Ariane Spass in the center here in, uh, from Kness about this uh, excellent uh, and perfect uh, uh, launch for these two satellites. Uh, I think we have also a very accurate uh, uh, orbit uh, position uh, this evening. So, uh, I think uh, this is the first reaction. Uh, the second, I uh, would uh, like to uh, say a few words about uh, our customer and our missions we would like to have with uh, Nawel. Uh, as the representative of the Daimler-Benz Aerospace, I am here today in a <laughs> triple function. My first function is the traditional. Uh, we are one of, as you know, the important uh, builder and producer of uh, important uh, uh, parts of the Ariane launcher. We had uh, this evening uh, four important parts uh, coming from our company. The second stage and the four liquid boosters. Uh, my second role, we had uh, this evening the first time as a, we are a customer of Ariane Spass because uh, we are responsible for the in-orbit delivery of uh, this satellite now, Elsat. And of course, my third role, as you know, we are, were the initiator and uh, the main shareholder of uh, the now Elsat uh, uh, SR. And uh, we think uh, that this evening is uh, a very, very uh, cornerstone for the uh, growing uh, economic uh, Latin American market, especially for the Argentina, the Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, and Paraguay, and up to the uh, Mexican uh, area. So we hope uh, that we can uh, have a lot of success to help uh, the increasing uh, uh, economic situation in, in uh, the South Latin America and uh, we are very confident that we can uh, bring soon, maybe beginning of next year, the second now satellite in orbit so that we can give uh, a good uh, support and a good uh, performance to our friends in uh, Latin America. Thank you very much again for the professional team of Ariane Spass. Thank you, Charles. 
So um, now, ladies and gentlemen, I convey you to our party, and I wish you a very good evening. Thank you. Allumage des huit moteurs. Décollage. Pression foyer normal. Tous les paramètres à bord sont normaux. Allumage des huit moteurs. Décollage. Pression foyer normale. So we reach the end of the serious part of the, this evening's proceedings. You heard from uh, Charles Bigot where we're going next. We hope you enjoyed the show. It was our pleasure to have you with us. So we hope you'll join us again in February for flight V94, carrying Intelsat 801. And so this is bye for now from... Sully Abrahamson. And Simon Hayes.